Has the Big 12 title race become more open now that Quinn Ewers is injured? We'll break that down today. We'll also have our weekly uh, podcast power rankings for the Big 12. Who is moving on up, moving on down? This is the Neighborhood Watch. I am your host, Josh Neighbors. Here on Crystal Ball College Football, we are part of the 365 Sports Network here. Make sure you guys like the videos and subscribe to the channel. Please do that. That helps us so much. Simple thing you all can do, just liking the video and subscribing to the channel does us a ton of good when you all do that. If you guys can't watch the show, uh, you can find us wherever you get your podcasts. Stitcher, Spotify, Apple Podcast, all of those places. Five stars if you do and you like the show. So that's always helpful as well. And then uh, on X slash Twitter at NWPod365, and I'm at Josh Neighbors underscore. Uh, guys, the Bread Truck Big 12 picks every Saturday. I put out my ATS against the Spread uh, Big 12 picks. This year we are 24 uh, and 17. So we're having a really nice year so far uh, against the Spread in the Big 12, which I feel like, you know, sometimes you put those things out and you're like, am I going to go 0 6 this week? Uh, but luckily I've had a pretty good feel for the league. All right, folks. Let's get to it. So big news came out yesterday. I guess I'm recording this on Monday night. But the big news came out about the status of Quinn Ewers. AC joint sprain. It's going to be a few weeks. They're saying week to week, but it sounds like it's going to be like two to four weeks. And uh, that means that Malik Murphy is going to be at the helm. And now obviously Arch Manning becomes the number two quarterback. And so that's a whole different can of worms. But this is huge news for Texas because Quinn Ewers was playing very, very well for the most part, uh, on a team that is definitely a Big 12 title contender at the very least, and then a potentially a national title contender. Uh, that might get thrown into a little bit of limbo, and you might think differently about it as the season's gone along. But still, 6-1, and one, number 7 in the country, and will be favored in the rest of their games, so that deserves some serious consideration. But the reason why I'm saying this could throw the Big 12 title picture into a little bit of disarray and chaos is this. We're going to go look at these Big 12 standings right now so I can show you all where everything sits right now. Because as the season has gone along, you felt like Oklahoma and Texas really have had none of, I mean, I guess stranglehold might be the wrong word, but it could be the right word. You know, like just they, they have been pretty dominant, I think is the right way to say it, right? And you see this, it's reflected in the standings. Oklahoma is 4-0, uh, 7-0 overall, number six in the country, and there's no other Big 12 team ranked. Texas is in a glut of teams. One, two, three, four. Uh, let's see. One, two, three, four. Yeah, four teams at three and one of the Big 12. And obviously, if you were to say which is the best team out of that group, uh, you know, I know Big 12 folks might not want to hear it, but Texas is the best team out of that group. At least so far they have been, right? I only have one loss, and their one loss is the best team in the conference right now. Uh, and so you think like Iowa State had a loss to, you know, had a bad loss earlier in the season to Ohio. Oklahoma State lost to USA by a ton of points. Kansas State, the Missouri loss, not too bad, but uh, obviously the Oklahoma State loss, you know, Oklahoma State's good, but you know, it was a uphill sledding for them. They did not look very good, and then they had the Missouri loss as well, too. So you have to count that against them, right? So Texas uh, has, generally speaking, looked very good. So you think about, okay, like what has to happen, you know, generally to avoid a all Oklahoma and Texas championship game and you know things have to break right well after this weekend you saw Oklahoma look pretty weak they can't run the football very effectively barely squeak by UCF and then you see Texas barely get by Houston with maybe a little bit of help from the officials and also Quinn Ewers goes down and so that game like Texas did win yes but that's a game that they lost last year that game reminded me so much of the Texas Tech game from 2022, they lost that game, they lost focus, and, and they've kind of been up and down, right? And then some of those big games, things have gone well, but you know, look, they lost a close one to OU, that happens. Um, but they've been able to distance themselves against Kansas, they did. They pulled out the game against Houston, right? So, like, you know, they, they've been, uh, you know, they've not been as Texas y as they were last year. But now with Quinn Ewers gone, you have to think, like, okay, what's up next for Texas? All right, Texas is now going to play BYU. Okay. BYU is not very good, folks. You look at the record and say, sure, and you'll see in my rankings, they actually dropped my power rankings because they're not a good football team. They're, they're not. They're just, they're opportunistic, but they're not good. Right. Like, you know, they're two and two in the league 
and they got a nice win this week, but their win over, you know, their first win against a big 12, uh, like a residing big 12 team, they beat Cincinnati, but they weren't excellent in that game. Their first win over a actual big 12 school is against a third string quarterback on a team. that's just not been very good in Texas tech and credit them for getting the job done still. But like, you know, it's not like their offense was dominant in that game. They played well, they outplayed them. They were better, but like, or can you say that BYU is better than a lot of other teams this league? I mean, it, are, can you even say they're a top half team, despite the fact that their record is five and two? Yeah, they're two and two in the league. Like, can you say it's top half team? I'm not really even sure you can say it's squarely a top half team. They're they're on the borderline, but I might have said the other day that they are. I don't know if that's true. Looking at who else is in the top half, right? 14 team league. Look at that in a second. But BYU could be tough, you know. Whatever. I mean, their defense can be decent at times, but I think they should be able to take care of business in that game. The big one's K-State, right? If this two-quarterback thing for K-State works out really well, well, it's it's a really interesting dynamic we have going into that contest. And I, I do not think by November 4th, which right now is recording when you all are seeing this, that's what, 10 days away, 11 days away, uh, whenever you are recording or whenever you are you know, uh, watching. Um, you know, so that game is, is, is huge. And I mean, I, I don't think he'll be back for that game. And so... K-State's a team right now that's clearly coming on. I mean, they are playing their best football of the season. They are finding their stride. The one thing, though, is that Will Howard is pretty decent passing the ball, and Avery Johnson was okay, too. That team's – the running is the better part of what they're doing right now, right? The run game is the better part of what the uh, K-State Wildcats are doing. And with that, you know, you know, you think, okay, well, can you run the ball against Texas? Ah, that's the difficult proposition. Thinking about who has run the ball well against Texas. Well, one team did. That was Oklahoma. But if you go and you look at that box score, right, a lot of the damage was done by Dylan Gabriel. Guys who are non-quarterback runners, and, and look, he, some of it was designed, but he did a lot of freelancing. And he didn't have a great re week running the football last week either. Against UCF, not a good run defense. Um, so, and then that's not a good Oklahoma running game. And so, like, you know, I think for the most part, it wasn't very good. Dylan Gabriel just played the game. of He was amazing in that game, game of his life. Great player. A pretty good player playing a great game, right? And that, that's what beat Texas. But I mean, Kansas, you go back to that Kansas game, Kansas didn't run the rock on them, right? Go back to that game, you know, uh, Neil, uh, you know, 45 yards, High Shaw, 45 yards. And look, the, the carry numbers, like they're, they're averaging five yards a rush, but it wasn't like it was a devastating rushing attack um, for them. And, and the offense was so good where they kept the ball away. So, you know, it was only 125 total rushing yards. It's not like some massive problem that you have in that situation. Yeah. I mean, the rest of the, you know, the rest of the teams like did not run the ball against them. Uh, I don't think Alabama did either. Yeah. Yeah. They didn't run the ball very well. hundred yards on 35 carries did not score a touchdown in that game. So that is the big challenge. Like, is this Texas run defense so good to where eh, it, it really doesn't matter what K state's bringing to the table because their best chance at winning is running the football. And so, you know, if that is the case and Texas run defense holds up, like K State's gonna have to break the trend, basically, right? That's the one big key to that game. If Murphy plays an average game, they still win because that case K State just can't get that running game going. The passing game has not been effective for them, right? So I think uh, I think that's a big question because if you go back to that Houston game and you say, "Hey, what did Houston do effectively?" Well, Donovan Smith got hot, and, th and those wide receivers got open. And K State right now, those wide receivers are you know I, I would take Houston's receiving core honestly, I would. I think Houston right now in terms of receivers, receivers, not, not all pass catchers, but like receivers, generally speaking, you would take, you know, the man jacks of the world, uh, the Matthew Goldens of the world, guys like that, you know, had a really good game, like Samuel Brown, you know, they, they got all of these guys involved and, and even, you know, Stefan Johnson, had a good game last week. Like they've got all these guys are able to use and that's not a dynamic receiving core, but they still had some success. So not saying K-State's receivers could, uh, you know, won't have any success at all, but like, it doesn't feel very, it doesn't feel super likely, right? It doesn't feel like that's going to all of a sudden be the trend that, that just gets bucked um, at this moment. But with that in mind, like still, we are gonna have to see how Malik Murphy looks, right? I mean, he was airmailing passes left and right now, you know, a little bit of uh, too much energy coming into the game, obviously tough spot to come into the game on for a young guy like that, but he has been around a little bit, right? In terms of experience, he is short on that, but he has been around for a hot minute. So it's a guy that too, you know, you feel like you should have, uh, you know, a pretty good idea of what the offense looks like. And, uh, but I, I do think like the pressure on Texas was ratcheting up in that Houston game. I think you're going to keep seeing that now, especially with Murphy in there at quarterback. I mean, if K-State wins that game, guys, like they have the tiebreaker 
over Texas, they have they'll have one less conference loss. That means Texas will need K State to lose twice, right? So that's the big part of this that that I think we have to consider is that's the game you circle. That is the game right there that could have massive implications. Now we have other tiebreak scenarios as well too. But if you look at who else is on the Texas schedule the rest of the year, TCU does not have a shot in the Big 12 title. Iowa State does, but I mean, hell, maybe maybe it is one of those years they're off a of bye. Maybe they're uh, they're just getting stronger and better with each game, right? That could be a diff- that could be a difficult challenge on the road at Jack Trice, and and I th- I hope that's a night game. I, I feel like it's a great like ABC type night game situation they can do, you know, late in the year. Uh, and then Tech does not feel like a threat right now to Texas, uh, but we'll have to see. Is Quinn Ewers back by November eighteenth? Right, two to four weeks. Is, is this a regular season ending injury? Can he make it back? And so there's a lot of questions that have to be asked there. And look, like some of these games where they're better than teams, like Texas Tech, they still beat, right? But at TCU, who's pretty average, like that staff can scheme it up, man. And look, that was one-way traffic last year. Texas will be motivated, but TCU wants a piece of that action too, right? I think, you know, TCU's had a lot of success against Texas. That feels like a throw the records out type situation, uh, mental edge for TCU there. But I, I, I you know, kind of d- digress on that. The K-State one's the big one, right? That is the game against another team that is tied with you in the conference right now that will decide this. And your quarterback, who's been one of your best offensive players, now Jonathan Brooks is their best offensive player. Xavier Worthy's most, most talented, but Ewers has done a good job making sure the trains have been running on time this year. And having him and having to replace him at this point, your bye week's already gone. Uh, that's tough, right? You just had a tough road game. You've got you know two, you know, one maybe potentially decent opponent coming in, probably not. Uh, you know, but still a 2:30 ABC game, so big spot. And then K State, and add the part on next guys that there is one Arch Manning who is in the wings. And look, I don't think it should be Arch. I think I'd give Murphy the chance, unless you have uh, we have you know information that Arch Manning all of a sudden has become this really good player and is is right there. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that you know that that is going to be a storyline. Like you know, I think Murphy's got to tune that out. He did in spring, but he's going to have to tune that out if they want to get the job done uh, and stay on track for what they're doing right now. And I think for them, it's funny. I actually, I made a bet with Drake Toll from Locked on Big 12. I said, 100 bucks, Texas makes the Big 12 championship game. And I felt really good about it. And even after the Houston game, it was close. I still feel really good about it. But you add the Murphy part into it. It's, it's more challenging now, right? I mean, if you lose the wrong game, you're in some serious trouble here. The tiebreak scenarios could come into play. So it's not a slam dunk, right? This is the one thing that could derail you. Now, they have built up quarterback depth. That is the one thing they do have, right? Uh, we think Murphy might be good, and he's going to have some chances, and I think they're going to tailor the offense more to him. And maybe, hey, the good thing is his wingman in the backfield is like the second best or the best player in the offense. So that's a good news. It's a good news thing, I think, for Texas. Um, but, you know, you think about like where Oklahoma State's position right now, they don't play Texas. All Oklahoma State does is play the big one for them is OU. That's the huge game left on the Oklahoma State schedule. You know, you know, we trust them now, but like, I don't, I'm not sure if I trust them all the way, but Oklahoma State guys, their last five games, they've got the new four and Oklahoma at home. That is the rest of the games. Now, I think, you know, with the way that I've seen the OU defense play, they're going to need a big time effort from Alan Bowman to win that game. Uh, I don't know if they're going to get it, but they're going to need a big time effort from Alan Bowman to win that game. It's going to be difficult to do. And OU's had Gundy's number uh, for a while now, right? And last year they did too. Spencer Sanders was hurt. But this shakes things up in terms of the Big 12 title race. This is not as much of a slam dunk OU in Texas as it was before. And maybe even for both teams, I do think for OU, you, you got a loss to burn, right? You, you do have a loss to burn because you've got to win over Texas. Um, and you do not you do not play K-State. Uh, Oklahoma State's the other contender that you've got. So that one makes it tough, but like if you burn one against KU this week, it doesn't actually kill you. Now, you know, you have to rebound next week on the road. That's tough, but you see what I'm saying. This, this is the stretch right here that will decide their season. So things have opened up a little bit more. If you ask me today, Josh, which two teams are playing the Big 12 championship game, I would still tell you Oklahoma and Texas, but that feels like a much different proposition. And maybe this thing for K-State, the two, the two QB thing is a snowball that rolls downhill that gains traction and just starts going off. Um, m- maybe not, but like, you know, I think I'm still comfortable right now. And look, I'm not going to trust Alan Bowman to get me all the way there. 
right? Uh, I, I like Alan Bowman. He's playing well, but uh, I'm not going to trust him to get me all the way there. The next thing we have to do on the show is the power rankings. That's going to reflect some of the stuff that we just talked about, but this was a weird one to do. And I stand by everything I've, I'm doing here. Maybe it's because I messed up some of the other stuff before that these were weird, but Oklahoma is number one. Texas is number two. They're staying there. And I'm, I'm not like accounting for the Murphy factor, but they still have to be number two. K-State's number three. They jumped ahead there. Um, and I've got them ahead of Oklahoma State. The reason why is I know they played and head-to-head and Oklahoma State won the game. But that's a different version of, of, of K-State, right? This that That is this version of Oklahoma State. If you factor in Avery Johnson to that game, it's a different story, in my opinion. Uh, and I honestly probably should flip those. Actually, I, I just felt like having Oklahoma State climb seven spots would have been ridiculous. Um, but like, you know, I, I think you could split hairs. Just this is a different version of K-State now. And I think both guys adding stuff to the table. And, and I think the important thing for K-State too is having Will Howard run and having, having Avery Johnson pass is very important to keep defenses on their toes, right? I hate it when guys just bring in quarterbacks. All right, he's a running quarterback and he's just going to run. Uh, he's a passing quarterback. He's just going to pass. I do not think it's effective to do that. So I am glad that they're having both those guys do those things. Oklahoma State, they should be third or fourth right there. Once again, I know they played. That feels like it's a different version of K-State. And, you know, K-State right now, after the two games that they've last played and discovering, uh, you know, discovering what they have in Avery Johnson, a bit more of a wagon situation right now. Kansas drops one spot. They're off to number five. They've been in that five range the entire year. West Virginia drops two spots to number six. It was a close game at back and forth, but, like, they're, they're starting to run out of steam. All right, they've got to figure some things out. I think I do think Garrett Green's getting better. I just don't think the receivers are that good all the time, um, and he's not, he's still getting there, you know, and whatnot. And that run game's a little bit inconsistent. Their defense is banged up now, so it's starting to fall apart a little bit for them. I I would be interested to watch them play Iowa State. Um, I think a West Virginia Iowa State game uh, would be very intriguing. We don't get that this year, sadly, right? But West Virginia is going to play UCF this week on the road, and they're a seven point dog. So that's why I have them right there. But I, Iowa State moving up a spot. I just feel I, I think Matt Campbell's going to have a nice week off the bye and I trust that situation. BYU drops two spots because here's the thing, guys. Like I had them ahead before, but I think about it now. They're five and two, sure. But like, would you take them against Iowa State? Would you? I think the West Virginia game would be closer ish, but like I, I would definitely favor Iowa State right now over BYU. And I would still, I would favor West Virginia over BYU too. I think they're a better team than West Virginia is or uh, than BYU is. TCU stays there even after a, a one-way loss because I can't put Tech ahead of them. Uh, tech drops three spots to 10. You know, it's tough for them right now, obviously, the third-string quarterback in, but it is what it is. You still have to deal with injuries and whatnot. So that's that. UCF holds on to number 11. Good result for them, but still they've lost four straight games. That has to be considered. UCF and Texas Tech, that'd be a really close, fun, intriguing game right now. Um, and UCF probably wins that game, so I honestly could have put them ahead, but like, Still, UCF's lost four straight games has not won a conference game, so I can't give them that respect just yet. Houston up one spot after a nice effort last week against Texas, but still up and down type team. Baylor, uh, they are not the worst team in the league. They're the second worst team in the league right now. We cannot put them ahead of Houston just because of how badly they've played overall, but this is for sure. Cincinnati is the worst team in the league. There you go. Your Big 12 power rankings and also some conversation. But hey, is this Big 12 title race now open because of the Quinn Ewers injury. Make sure you all follow us on Twitter at Josh Neighbors underscore for me at NWPod365 as well. Uh, make sure you all like the video, subscribe to the channel. We appreciate when you all do. And we will talk to you folks manana. Spencer McLaughlin is going to come on. We're going to talk about the new Big 12 schools. Arizona looks really strong. I'm going to ask him about them. We'll also talk about Michael Luke about that later on this week. Uh, Arizona State, still feisty, man. They're they're banged up. And I think Kenny Dillingham is doing a good job fighting with what he's got right now. Colorado, not great after their loss to Stanford, but still you have to respect what Deion Sanders has done uh, there this year. And then Utah, what else can be said about what the Kyle Whittingham is doing right now? All right, folks, we'll get after that.